Darren Waller, the race construction engineer for divisions 10 and 12. Uh, in this segment, I'm going to go over porch slabs and box beam bridges. How many in the room here have not worked on a porch slab or box beam bridge? Okay, so we do have a couple. All right. Uh, throughout this session here, you'll hear me talk about uh, core slabs and box beams. Essentially, when I use those phrases, they're interchangeable. Uh, they're, I'll point out a couple slight differences here, but for the most part, inspecting, installing, building bridges, they will be the same. Uh, so the topics we will go over are going to be substructure finishing, delivery, setting the slabs, post-tensioning, grouting, and then we'll go over the barrier rail layout and our asphalt and concrete overlays. Uh, here's the main differences between the cord slabs and box beams. If you'll notice on the top, cord slab is a shallower member. We typically use those on shorter spans, and it's got a circular void in the center to, to lighten up the uh, member. The box beams are deeper members. We use them on longer spans, and they just have a square void in them to lighten up the member. So for the most part, that's the basic difference as you'll see in the field. Uh, all the steps we talk about, tensioning, grouting, all the other stuff, pretty much they're the same for, for both of these type bridges. That's just the main difference you'll see in the plans. Substructure. Not going to go into a whole lot of detail here. We've got another section on concrete finishing. But I do want to point out a few things here that are different on the... These bridges compared to a board deck bridge, we do not have anchor bolts. That we have dowel bolts, uh, uh, dowel bars instead of anchor bolts, and we have non-laminated elastomeric bearing pads. Uh, basically, those mean the, the typically the elastomeric pads on a board deck bridge with bigger girders, heavier loads. They have steel plates layered in there. These are just the uh, solid elastomeric. Uh, but even though we don't have anchor bolts. We need to treat these down bars as they were anchor bolts. They still have a planned location. They need to be right. I know we're going to have a, uh, a void in the top of our slabs that sit down over top of them that you've got some room to play, but we do not need to take that for granted. Lay these out, check them just like you would an anchor bolt because it's, it, for all the runs that's in here that have worked on a core slab bridge, if you've ever laid a tape measure down, on those voids at the ends, they're not in the right location. They either didn't get laid out right at the plant, they moved during pouring, what's secured properly, they will be in the wrong location. So we want to make sure we're correct in the field so as we go further in our steps of putting this bridge together, we won't have any issues. So just keep that in mind that we need to uh, <coughs> check those just like an anchor bar. Here, does anybody think this is a good idea? When should we have checked and caught this? Right, when the concrete is still plastic. When we're pouring, we need to check these with a straight edge. Make sure we get a good finish because we'll go into some details later on in the presentation of what, what this can cause. Um, the other option is at this point here, we've got to grind it. You know, we can grind that smooth, which is, you know, it's acceptable. We do allow it but it's not ideal. What, when, we, when we put a grinder on fresh concrete, what, what are we doing to that substructure? What, what's that top layer that we, when they're pouring it? Right, you're bringing that grout to the top, sealing your stone, we want a good seal of grout. But when you put that grinder on there, you've just removed years off of that structure. Anybody been out on the old bridge deck that we're tearing down? You see the stone in the deck? Well, when it was poured, it was sealed. You know, it had grout on it. Traffic over time has wore that down to the stone, getting that protective coating off. Well, we'll take years of it off with a grinder just because we didn't check it when it was green, you know, before it set up. So remember, check that. It, it'll make things go easier down the road as you start setting your beams on there and tensioning. So keep that in mind. When they're poured, make sure they have a straight edge. We'll get that right. Uh, after substructure is built, our next steps, we're going to get the beams coming on site. We're going to get delivery. So there's several things we need to look at while they're coming on site. 
We need to inspect these beams while they're on the truck. That's the easiest time to walk around them, uh, take a look for any, any cracks, damages that may have happened in shipping. Uh, make sure they have an M&T stamp. But just because they're stamped, approved by M&T, that does not mean we have to accept them on the job. M&T accepted them at the plant. We don't know if they've been run into with a truck, they damaged them while loading the truck, something happened in the delivery, so inspect them. And if you see cracking, you know, something like this with a repair, there should be a non-conformance report out there, an NCR report that shows where they had some type of repair at the plant. So if we're seeing damages, we need to be checking to make sure we got that. Uh, it's like right here on the truck, as you can see, you know, easier to walk around and look at. We set it in place, you can't get out there over that span, you got to crawl on the cap, it's hard to look at. You got to have a harness on, fall protection so you can look over the edge, do a lot on the ground, you can walk around it real easy. Here's our uh, high cam stamp, should be on every beam. We need to make sure of that. We got a location mark of where it should be placed, what span, what order. You may know what this number is right here in the center. <coughs> Yeah. Right. Anybody that's worked on these bridges knows if you don't get that on your material received paperwork, send it to the office, that paperwork's coming back to you. They need that number to make sure it's approved and it enters into our system that uh, all the uh, backup documentation and the uh, reports from the plant match up. So we need to do that while it's on the truck. A whole lot easier to write that number down. This is an end bit here, but if it was an interior bit, you set that next span next to it, you just covered up all your numbers. It'll be very difficult to get those numbers. So get all that information, paperwork, while it's on the truck. It's a whole lot easier. Once they get there, we get ready to put them in place. We need to make sure that we're always lifting from the pick points that's on this cast into the tops of this girder, uh, box beam. Uh, don't put a sling around it, do something different because the contractor wants to. I've never had an issue with that personally, but just keep in mind those pick points that are in the uh, tops of the beams have been designed in a specific location for a reason, so use them. Uh, <clears throat> when we're setting girders, we may have some differential camber we need to look for. There's not a whole lot you can do sometimes, but it just happens, but um, it will kind of mess up with some concrete and asphalt overlays if you got a lot of excessive camber. You know, if it's excessive, talk to your resident VCEs, then let us know. We may need to rearrange some slabs while you're there. If you've got a couple that you know, get them to go gradually, if you just got one sticking out, there's not a whole lot we can do a lot of times. But keep an eye on that. It can pose some problems down the road as we uh, continue with construction. Anybody know which way we set slabs? Anybody know why we set slabs? Good answer. It makes it two narrow spans instead of one long. If you have a mistake, you good from left to right. Yeah, when the state, the state start increasing. Exactly. Great answer. That's exactly the reason. <coughs> we need to... <laughs> I don't have any candy here today. <laughs> oh, there's some over here on the table. Oh, right. Okay. Right. Oh, Steve, he was giving Steve, your, Steve, your candy here today. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's exactly right. If you start on one edge, and we talked about these uh, dowel bars early on, if you have a mistake in one of these earlier slabs or even just start off at the wrong location, don't get a good measurement mark to start with, as you work across that bent, the, the air could grow and accumulate on you. So you get to the end, you know, you may be sitting up on top of a dial bar and it won't fit at all. So at least if we start in the middle and work our way out, we can at least have that air. You know, we don't, we've got half as many slabs to set that that air will not grow on you. Uh, you know, the order I showed here on the slides, it does not have to be that order, one direction or the other. You can finish one side. You can alternate them back and forth, just whatever the contractor wants. But we don't want to start on the far left and work all the way to the right, if all possible. You may get in a scenario, crane lows, whatever, that you have to do that. But it's better if we can get them to set from the center. Uh, I had one about a year or so ago. I tried my best to get the contractor set from the center. No. I got a sidewalk on this side. I got to make sure that outside edge lines up perfectly. You know, I, you know, he had every excuse in the book. I said, well, we need to start from the center. You're going to have problems if you don't. Well, 
we got to the last two girders, or uh, box beams up there on the outside, well, you know, would not sit down on the dowel. I mean, we was missing them maybe a half inch, you know. It just it just would not go down on top of that, um, that dowel bar. And so we had to grind it off, set the slabs, core new dowel holes, grout, you know, down with an extra long drill bit. I mean, it was a pain. It started from the middle. I'm confident we would not have had that problem because we barely missed it. So uh, just keep that in mind. <clears throat> Next thing, when you're setting, I always like to recommend this method. Every now and then you'll have a contractor, this same contractor, he didn't want to do this either. Uh, he'd rather put his men's safety in jeopardy in my mind. But as you notice here, this slab is, is angled. This inside choker here is shorter than the outside. Uh, anybody know why that is? Anybody ever seen that done? So when, the, when you set it, you actually pinch it in. <coughs> exactly. That that that's the edge, the corner that we cannot see down here behind on that lower left is riding down the side of that beam that's already in place. So as the crane operator lowers it, lowers it down, all these two laborers have to do on this cap is just push it and hold it next to it. As it lowers down, it will get a good tight fit next to the. the the adjacent beam and that's the best you can get now I know we've all seen the method where they have the pry bar standing on the cap you know that's dangerous if that crane operator accidentally makes a sudden move they can smash the guy's leg pull the shoulder out could knock him off the cap so this right here the best method I've seen done it works great gets a good tight fit so if, if, if you see a contractor not doing that recommend it to them all it takes is a extra size shackle, a little small shackle, a couple extra inches different on that outside there. Also, if they don't do it like that, if they got no level, they put it in, it can also break off pieces of the existing box beam. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the corners and prying on and all that, there, there's all kinds of issues that come up, but, you know, try to get them to do this method if you will, and my experience is if, if they ever do it this way one time, they'll do it that way from now on because it works great. <coughs> Here's just another shot of the slabs after they've already been set on that interior span. Uh, a few things to watch for is the camber. I talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, that can cause some steel clearance issues when we get to if we're doing a uh, concrete overlay. Uh, we need to look see if our beams are resting fully on our elastomeric pads. They're designed for 100% bearing on those elastomeric pads. That's something we need to be looking for. We don't get a good substructure finish on our uh, concrete, you may not get that bearing pad with full, full bearing, so keep that in mind. Um, here's that situation. Anybody see it's kind of dark right there, but see that? Mm -hmm. We don't have full bearing. Uh, the, the back appears to be sitting down, but the front's not, so that's probably a cap finishing issue, or it, it's kind of hard to tell, it possibly could be a uh, beam issue or, or could be if the uh, super uh, the slope on the bridge, the profile of the bridge and the cap's level, there could be some different issues going on here. But in my mind, that extreme, somebody made a mistake in the finishing either of the substructure or that beam was not cast properly. Yes, sir. If you notice uh, most of all these problems happen on the end. You rarely do you have that situation in the interior. And my theory is they chamfer the stream face, but they're not chamfering the field face. They just chalk the line and drive the nail. And so that when you start finishing, you pinch it on the top of the nail of the head, you're not getting that finish that you would on the interior bit when you screen between two chamfers. Right, could be. Yep, exactly. But it's not in the plan, you don't have to put the chamfer on. On the back side, too. Backside. I try to get my contractors to do it. I can't make them do it. I explain why. Yeah, that, that could take, yeah, if you do that, yeah, that could take one. This problem. It could eliminate one potential error, exactly. That's probably well, a good, I good idea. I make them go back while take a run. Exactly, and that's what I like to see. Some type of straight edge, level, something, and check, you know, check those grades, check that uh, cap. Because here is a little different situation than we normally see when we get into post tensioning. Uh, I will we'll talk about it more, but a lot of times if we have some other issues in the post-tensioning process, this whole bearing pad on the outside will lift up off. And we'll, we'll go into that a little bit further detail later. 
Uh, this here appears to be a finishing issue. Uh, <clears throat> already talked about a lot of this here. You know, the issues that come up, your dowels are not in place, they don't sit over top of your slab, so that's one of the things, if your slab's not sitting down, you know, you might need to investigate, is it resting on one of your dowels? And then we need to check the, uh, for skew problems, uh, lining up the beams at our end vents and our vents. They need to be in a straight line. Uh, one way we can check, M&T, or the, the plant puts match marks on these girders from the factory where they're making them. So keep that in mind. <laughs> That's not an exact match. You know, we need to make sure the ends are lined up. <clears throat> but that's just a guide that we can go by. Uh, here, as you can see, that's not what we're looking for. Those beams need to line up through there. But depending on the type of bridge we've got, especially if we've got a concrete overlay with a foam joint, at this end, we start putting our elastomeric concrete, put that foam joint there, we got a cantilevered section that's going to hang out over top of some of these areas of these beams that traffic's going to impact on. You know, that cantilever section with all those wheel loads impacting over time potentially is going to break that last America off and make that joint fail. So when they're setting these beams in place, we need to make sure those skews and those ends line up. Here, that's a good example of a good tight fit. If the beams are made properly, we do our job, contractor does, setting those beams in place, that's what we're looking for good tight fit below that keyway. Uh, for those of you that have not built these bridges before, that section right there, that void, that's the keyway. We'll get into that later when we talk about grounding, just so you have an idea of what we're talking about. That's, that, that's the keyway. <clears throat>